Okay, here we go. Uh, we'll keep going here, and uh, some people will continue to log on after we start. So thank you for attending this evening's webinar. This is the first time the Bureau of EMS has developed an online update for all of our EMS providers statewide, all 60,000 of you. As we move forward, we will be looking at ways to improve how updates are pushed out to you. The Bureau is also revamping the Regional Faculty Program, which will allow us to utilize regional faculty locally and more often in the future. As with any new project, I'm sure there'll be some bumps along the way, but hopefully the successes will outweigh the bumps in the road. We look forward to your constructive feedback as we move forward. As some of you may know, we had some issues with our first webinar with audio. That's why we limited this session to the number of people that could participate. And because of that, we are going to have a recorded version of your webinar, either tonight's webinar or a separate webinar that we're going to do. And we'll email the link out to the recorded version to everybody who has signed up for any of the webinars. Plus, we'll send it out to the REMSCOs, program agencies, and as many listservs as we can. The recorded version will be the same as this evening's is. You'll be able to register for the recorded session, and you'll get the quiz just like you will with this one here, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So that way you're going to have your CMEs get to you, and you'll be all set. So the recorded version will also be downloadable according to WebEx. Um, as long as it is, you can also download it and present it to a larger crowd if need be. This evening's update will cover the new spinal protocol that has been approved by the State Emergency Medical Services Council, SEMSCO. We will also cover an update to the hemorrhage control protocol that is in the final stages of approval by the State Emergency Medical Services Council. This approval should come at their next meeting in December, but we wanted to be able to get you the information now in anticipation of the protocol being approved. As we move forward, we'll be looking to do annual protocol updates, similar to as we're doing now, but only once a year. The plan right now is to do it sometime in the late spring. That way, instructors can get everything ready for their fall courses that are coming up. Of course, any urgent updates will be sent out as they have in the past instead of waiting for one update statewide. There is a 25-question quiz which will be available after you complete this webcast. You should be able to click on the same link you used to enter the webcast, and you'll see a link down towards the bottom of the page, and it'll say test. You should also have received an email today or tomorrow that gives you a separate link to take the test. You'll have two weeks to complete the test. After you've completed the test and scored at least 80%, you will receive a certificate via email from us probably around September, in the first week of September. But you'll also get an email from WebEx immediately following the quiz with your grade, and that way you can have that to make sure that you did pass the quiz and show anybody for your CMEs that you need before you get your certificate. There is a skills component that needs to be completed and can be done locally. Please reach out to your agency training officer or your regional EMS council to find out where a local skills session may be held near you. Agencies who are participating in the CME Refresher Program should first reach out to the CIC that is affiliated with their program to see if they can assist you in the skills portion. We have placed an Adobe PDF copy of today's webinar, all the PowerPoints, including some other information under course material. The registration link that you receive will bring you to that section that says course material. You can download the information to use at a later date. Also included in that course material is the actual protocol we'll be discussing tonight, T8, the spinal protocol. We also included the respiratory protocol as well and some frequently asked questions that many people have had. CME refresher requirements. This update is approved for three hours of New York State CME. It can be utilized for preparatory or trauma core or additional hours as well. Keep a copy of this webinar's PDF in your CME file at your agency. Keep a copy of the certificate that you're gonna receive from us in September as well as a copy of the email you receive from WebEx with your course with your quiz grade on it. This presentation will not only review the specific protocols, but also discuss some of the best practices that have been learned from around the country. 
as you can imagine, I mean, we've got about 256 different people logged in, and I know we've got some areas like Good Samaritan Hospital and some other areas that have got large number of people watching this at the same time. So it's going to be difficult for me and probably impossible for me to respond to your chats if you do send me a chat. So I will look at those chats later at the end of the broadcast and try to get to some of your questions. So as with anything, there's always uh, some legal stuff we have to take care of, any liability. Um, the department doesn't have liability for any products or information that we're discussing here. Uh, the department does not endorse any specific uh, manufacturers, uh, commercially made items or non-commercially made items. There's going to be some links that will be available to you at the end of the sessions, and we don't have any control over those links once we um, put them into the presentation. They may have changed, or there could even be some pop-up advertisements that we were not aware of and were not present when we did the research and gave you the links. So we're going to talk about the BLS Hammers protocol first before we move on to the spinal. A technical advisory group, or a TAG, from the State Emergency Medical Advisory Committee, CMAC, was headed by Dr. Carl Goodman from Suffolk County. In conjunction with STAT, the State Trauma Advisory Committee, we were able to develop a new protocol and revise the hemorrhage control protocol that will hopefully be approved in December. So we're offering you this educational update a little bit ahead of time so you can be prepared ahead of time so when the protocol is approved in December and we ship it out, you'll be all set. There won't be any other additional training for that. So in the meantime, the current protocol is still active. All right, so why are we changing the hemorrhage protocol, or any of our protocols for that matter? As with most changes in EMS, the changes come from lessons learned military experience, and through current events that happen. No one can argue that we are seeing more and more mass casualty incidents where tourniquets have saved lives. Tourniquets are being supplied to all military personnel, many police officers, and in some instances, civilians. There are commercial products that have been designed to be used by the public, for example, school teachers, for mass shootings, and many of these kits do include tourniquets. Even though the current New York State BLS protocol does include the use of tourniquets, our research has shown that many providers are still very hesitant to use them. Some trauma centers have reported that providers are saying they can't use a tourniquet or that they can't only use it under very limited circumstances, such as the patient will die without it. And that actually was not true even with the last protocol, but it's going to be more emphasized with this protocol. So our hope is that this presentation will better educate our providers statewide and offer them the ability to have increased knowledge and then thereby taking better care of their patients. Just going to do one quick check to make sure that we've still got audio going. Somebody can let me know that because a couple of people are saying they don't have audio. Okay, good. Looks like uh, quite a few people do have the audio. So we'll continue on here with the patient assessment. We have always been taught airway before breathing, before circulation. With the 2010 AHA changes, we began to utilize the CAB sequence, circulation, airway, and then breathing. We all know that in most cases, ABCs are done simultaneously, unless, of course, we are in a testing environment where sequential steps can be easier to grade. When we arrive and see a patient with severe bleeding and they are awake and talking to us, we don't usually systematically and sequentially begin with A, then B, then C. We are really on automatic pilot. During the education process, it's easier to learn things sequentially until the student is able to reach the synthesis stage of learning process and it becomes almost second nature to them, which it is for you now. Assessing blood loss is difficult. Studies have shown that medical personnel of all different licenses and certifications tend to err when estimating blood loss. Blood loss tends to be overestimated at low volumes and underestimated at high volumes of loss. If there are signs of arterial bleeding or life-threatening bleeding, 
you should take care of it right away and defer further assessment. You can do more than one thing at a time. Controlling bleeding while talking to your patient allows you to assess their airway. Don't delay treatment to stop the bleeding. PPE is a must. Be prepared ahead of time, just as you are with all the rest of your calls. Once you find life-threatening bleeding, you need to take care of it immediately. That is not the time to go back and find your PPE in your ambulance or your vehicle. Clothing can disguise blood very well. You need to expose the area that is bleeding so you can do an accurate assessment and develop a strategy to control the bleeding. You don't want to place your hand over the clothing and find out that there's a sharp object lying underneath the clothing. Dressings will do little to control any bleeding if they're placed over clothing. Once you expose the site, you can then determine the severity of the bleeding and possibly any other associated injuries in the area of the bleeding. Applying direct pressure with a sterile dressing will control most bleeding that we've come in contact with in EMS. However, if it is severe or arterial, you may need a hemostatic dressing or even a tourniquet as your first line of treatment. So as you can see, we're starting to move the tourniquet up higher in our treatment to the first line treatment if needed. Remember, hemostatic dressings need to be laid directly on the wound site or they will not work. Follow the manufacturer's instructions for the hemostatic dressings that you use. At present, injectable solutions and foam products are not included in this protocol. If a tourniquet is your first line treatment, remember that you still need to apply dressings over the site of the bleeding, if possible, to protect it. Once you begin the process of controlling the severe bleeding, you need to move on to the rest of your assessment. Don't get sidetracked with the obvious. The not so obvious or the unseen problems could be what hurts your patient even more. Assure airway, breathing, circulation are all adequate. Assessing circulation and neurological status above and below the bleeding site is an important part of your assessment. Elevation and pressure points have been found to have little to no effect in controlling bleeding, in part because it can waste valuable time if a tourniquet is needed and pressure points are difficult to find and very difficult to maintain. So yes, elevation and pressure points are now out of the protocol. For those instances where direct pressure and pressure dressings are not working, you need to be prepared to move to the next step, placing a tourniquet. You should not remove the dressings that are directly on the surface of the wound site. This can dislodge any clotting that may have already taken place and thereby increasing the bleeding. You can add additional dressings on top of the dressings that are soaked through. Remember though, this is primarily done to soak up any of the blood but has little effect on controlling the actual bleeding. Numerous studies have been done, mostly in the military environment, concluding that when tourniquets are used in a timely manner, patient outcomes are improved. Studies have also shown that there are little to no complications with the use of tourniquets. The positives far outweigh the potential negatives. The tourniquets that proved to be the most effective were commercial devices, especially the Combat Application Tourniquet, or CAT, which many studies have found to safely and effectively occlude blood flow with a low incidence of adverse events. The CAT is only one of many FDA-approved commercial devices. Many times, non-commercial devices don't perform adequately as a tourniquet, but more as a ligature device thereby not occluding the blood flow, but only slowing it down. For this reason, it may be more appropriate to use a commercial device instead of improvising. Use the right tool for the job, but you still need to know how to improvise if that tool is not available to you or is not working appropriately. However, this does not mean you have to go out and buy an expensive tourniquet. With practice, you may be able to accomplish bleeding control with non-commercial devices, well, you need to practice and be very sure that whatever device you're going to use is going to work and that you're able to assess it, completely stop the, the bleeding by that device. Many of the commercial devices were developed by or in conjunction with the military and are able to be self-administered, which is what is needed during a combat incident. 
tactical response teams and police departments are utilizing these tourniquets quite often and have been uh, given to most of the officers that are out there. All right, this is an example of just a few of the devices that have been used as tourniquets over the years. No matter what device you use, make sure you know how to use it according to the manufacturer's instructions and that you've practiced using it. The device in the bottom right of the slide is actually a device that was used during the Civil War. Although the exact number of surgeries performed during the Civil War is not known, approximately 60,000 or three quarters of all the surgeries were to perform the amputations. Without the use of a tourniquet, many of those soldiers would have died. 620,000 soldiers did die during the Civil War, but two-thirds of them died from disease and not blood loss from their wounds. There are many discussions occurring regarding where the placement of the tourniquet should actually go. At this point in time, we're going to use the rule of thumb of placing a tourniquet one to three inches above the site of the bleeding. If that happens to be over a joint, then you would go one to three inches above that proximal joint. Some studies do use the placement of high and tight method to place the tourniquet, where you place it as high in the limb as possible, proximal to the trunk of the body. High and tight is used more often in an unsafe and tactical environment because it may be safer for the provider to apply the tourniquet. The goal is to control massive bleeding within 60 seconds. Although there are key differences in the training approach, providers can meet the goal of tourniquet placement with arterial occlusion within 60 seconds only through repetitive and supervised training application of each selected device that they're going to use. So really the key here is practice with the devices that you have. All right, next there's going to be a short video here. And the sound may be off a little bit on this video. You may see the sound lag a little bit, depending on your internet connection. But you'll get the uh, point of this. We only have two videos in tonight's session anyways. Hello, I'm Dr. David King, a trauma surgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital, assistant professor of surgery at the Harvard Medical School, and a combat surgeon for the United States Army. This video is intended to provide instruction on the appropriate way to apply a tourniquet for massive low extremity bleeding. The first step is to identify the wound and loop the tourniquet around the limb one to three inches above the wound. Importantly, the tourniquet may be placed over clothing. The second step is to ensure that the tourniquet is looped through the buckle twice. The third step is to pre-tension the tourniquet. This is done by vigorously pulling on the free end of the tourniquet and tightening it such that a finger cannot be interposed between the tourniquet and the patient's skin. The fourth step is to twist the wind lap up to three times or until there is cessation of bleeding. The fifth step is to inspect the wound to ensure there's no ongoing bleeding and to palpate for a distal pulse, which should be absent. The sixth step is to achieve hemostasis. Inspect the wound. If there's ongoing bleeding, ensure there are three twists in the first tourniquet and apply a second immediately adjacent to and above the first. Once the tourniquet is in place, it should be left up and tight until evaluated by a surgeon at a hospital. Tourniquets can save lives on the battlefield and in the homeland. This instructional video provides the basic necessary information to properly apply a tourniquet for a massively bleeding wound. In my experience, a properly applied tourniquet can save lives. This is a skill set that anybody can master, just like the Heimlich maneuver or the CPR. Yes, and you must have that music playing in the background as you're putting the tourniquet on or else it won't go on properly. I know the music does make that video, but that's just an example of showing you how the devices should be in place. You can see how they check the patient afterwards to assure that they had the uh, proper attention of the tourniquet and so forth. So that was just a quick video to show you on that. 
So a tourniquet application, we're going to go over those steps again here. Ensure that the tourniquet is tight enough to occlude distal pulses. You should also recheck to make sure that the tourniquet is not loosened and the pulses have not returned distal to the tourniquet. Tourniquets are not a place it and forget about it device. Keep the tourniquet and the site of the bleeding visible with no clothing, blankets, or sheets obstructing your view. Do not remove the tourniquet or dressings to reassess the bleeding. Once your tourniquet is applied, you need to assess that it is working correctly. Check for distal pulses. There should be no pulses distal to the tourniquet. Make sure you know where to find the appropriate pulse for the appropriate land and location of where you place the tourniquet. Locating pulses can be tricky and you should be able to practice this on multiple patients and other people to get a better understanding of where and how to find these pulses. If you still have distal pulses, you may need to tighten the tourniquet a little bit more or rethink your placement of the first tourniquet and apply a second tourniquet. One of the most common tourniquet application errors is not getting the tourniquet tight enough, usually because we don't want to cause pain to the patient and we know they're in pain already. But you need to make sure that it does include all distal pulses. The standard documentation that you have applied a tourniquet on your patient is still writing it on the patient's forehead. That's internationally known, but you could also use two or three inch wide tape Place that on the forehead with the information written on the tape. That might be a little bit better. In this example, we have TQ1834, which means that the tourniquet was applied at 1834. You can also place the location on that if you like. The only problem with placing the location is if you put multiple tourniquets on, they may not find the second tourniquet. Since this is really a universal designation that the patient has a tourniquet in place, you should always use it. You will also need to document all information in your patient care report, including where you documented the tourniquet placement on the patient's body. If you decide to apply a second tourniquet because either you've still got distal pulses and you can't tighten the first one enough or you've still got bleeding, it should be placed proximal or above the first tourniquet by approximately one to three inches. Follow the same application procedure and reassess for distal pulses and how the bleeding is controlled now. This kind of brings us back to the high and tight method. If you utilize the high and tight method, you aren't going to be able to put a second tourniquet on above the first tourniquet, which could cause some increased side effects. But again, we're going to get that hammered out for you at the December SEMSCO meeting, and you'll see that in the final protocol of which way they decide to go with it. In this picture here, this shows the approximate location of where you should place the first tourniquet and then where the second tourniquet should be placed in relation to the first tourniquet. This is an example of an amputation at the ankle. Because of the fact that there are two bones in the lower leg, it can be more difficult to control bleeding there than it would be if the tourniquet is placed on the upper leg above the knee, where there's only one bone. But this does not mean you usually go directly to the upper leg. It does mean that you need to keep a close eye on the effectiveness of the first tourniquet when it is placed on the lower leg. Tourniquets should not be removed in the field by EMS providers. Only after reaching definitive care or on orders of your medical control physician should you remove a tourniquet. This general rule applies to those patients who will reach definitive care within two hours of the application of the tourniquet. If it will be more than two hours, medical control should be contacted for advice. If a tourniquet is removed and replaced with a pressure dressing, you should leave the tourniquet in place but loosened or untightened to not restrict the blood flow in case you need to reapply the tourniquet later. Also, if a tourniquet is removed, it should be removed slowly to reduce the chance of severe bleeding returning. And for all of us old folks who have been around for quite a while, it's the same concept as we use with the mass pants. When you deflated the mass pants, you did it slowly so the bleeding or the uh, blood flow returns slowly. If your patient needs a tourniquet, they may be highly susceptible to hypotension. Make sure you continue to reassess the patient and their vital signs. 
Vital signs should be taken at least once every five minutes. Assessing a tourniquet and distal pulses should also be a component of your vital signs. Pay close attention to the trends in the patient's vital signs. Is the pulse rate faster each time you take it? Is the blood pressure showing any signs of lowering each time you take it? Watch for subtle hints of vital perfusion. Whether your patient has an isolated extremity injury or is a multiple trauma, make sure you know your trauma triage protocol to assure that the patient is taken to the closest, most appropriate hospital, for example, the trauma center. And above all, document, 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 not just the universal tourniquet documentation, but all the patient information, including your trended vital signs, so you can show the physician and the staff whether or not the patient is starting to decompensate. Some additional considerations. Many of these patients who require a tourniquet may need to have advanced life support interventions. The most common intervention may be fluid replacement through IVs. However, your patient will most likely be in quite a bit of pain, so pain management needs to be considered. A tourniquet in and of itself can cause quite a bit of pain, let alone just the injury that caused the severe bleeding to begin with. Another consideration is for compartment syndrome. Although fairly rare, tourniquets can cause compartment syndrome, especially in long-term tourniquet usage. This is why tourniquets are usually limited to 90 minutes of application. Advanced life support providers should be called for patients who may have an extended transport time or extrication time to monitor for compartment syndrome. There are more and more devices being manufactured all the time and sold commercially that aid in controlling severe bleeding in one form or another. This is just an example here of some, including the junctional tourniquet and the skin closure devices. Currently, the protocol allows for the devi these devices to be used only by formally designated tactical medical response teams who have been designated through the regional REMAC. Okay, next we're going to talk about our dialysis patients, which can give us a little bit of a uh, different complication here. We're seeing more and more patients on dialysis for various reasons. There are more than 500,000 people currently undergoing hemodialysis treatment. The aging population is anticipated to have a large impact on the increase of dialysis patients as the risk of end-stage kidney disease increases with age. Patients who need dialysis on a routine and long-term basis will most likely have an arteriovenous fistula, also known as an AV fistula. This is usually found in the forearm. The AV fistula connects a vein and an artery together and causes a stretching or dilation of the newly formed vessel. Although fairly rare, but still one of the most common complications of AV fistulas is bleeding from the hemodialysis site, and the bleeding from the site can be life-threatening. Patients are trained to check the blood flow through their fistula on a daily basis. This is done by touch and sound. When you place your fingers over the fistula, you should be able to feel the motion of the blood flowing through it, just as you do if you're taking a patient's radial pulse. To listen for blood flow, use a stethoscope and place it flat on the fistula. The sound you hear is called the brewy. Any change in the pitch may indicate a clot or a narrowing of the fistula. The sound may change from a whooshing sound to more of a whistle-like sound if it is becoming narrowed. If you are concerned enough to evaluate the fistula, and if the patient has assessed themselves on a routine basis, you may wish to have the patient assess themselves again to determine if there are any changes in what you're hearing or feeling. Direct digital pressure with a sterile dressing is usually sufficient enough to control most of the bleeding from a hemodialysis site. In these patients, tourniquets are really used as a last resort and only for life-threatening hemorrhage, partially because of the high risk of thrombosis and damage to the fistula, but still know that you may have to put a tourniquet on these patients. Here's an example of an AV fistula that is ruptured and is now bleeding externally. Notice the higher pressure of the blood flow. Applying direct, pr direct pressure to the site should stop the bleeding, but know that it may require the placement of the tourniquet. 
Additionally, some of these patients may be taking a medication to thin their blood, which will make it even more difficult for you to gain control of the bleeding. If you are going to place the tourniquet on these patients, try to get the tourniquet above where you see the AV fistula. Since this is in the lower arm, you might be better off placing the tourniquet above the elbow. So now let's take a look at the actual protocol as it stands today and hopefully will be approved at the December meeting of the SEMSCO. Right off the bat, applying direct pressure and or pressure dressing, no major change there. And this assumes that you've already removed um, any clothing or anything around the bleeding site and you've inspected it to find what kind of bleeding you have. Direct pressure on the left side here is effective in controlling bleeding. We'll go down that side first. Then assure that the airway and breathing are adequate and in your circulation, of course, because you've already been checking on that because it's bleeding. You've got to use the cab um, instead of the ABC. And then after you've assured airway, breathing, and circulation, and you're using a pressure dressing to control the bleeding, transport according to your uh, BLS trauma triage protocol. And most of these patients, they're going to go down the left side here, are going to be most of the patients that we do see and may not need a trauma center. They just may be able to go to a community hospital. So this is the routine for most of your patients that we're going to see. But in the next slide, we're going to talk about direct pressure is ineffective or impractical for whatever reason, maybe a hazardous area, uh, unable to get to the uh, bleeding site if they're entangled in the vehicle. But for whatever reason, hemorrhage can't be controlled. So then you're going to look at whether or not the wound is amenable for a tourniquet placement. If the wound is not amenable to a tourniquet placement, then maybe a junctional tourniquet or a skin closure device can be used if you are approved as a tactical response team. Go ahead and apply the tourniquet, and you see here it says high and tight, but we're going to continue to use the one to three inch above the site at this point, or one to three inches above the proximal joint, if it's going to be right around the joint area. And if that doesn't control the bleeding, apply a second tourniquet if hemorrhage has not been controlled. Again, that tourniquet goes just above where the first tourniquet is. And this is really where the discussion is going to be happening in December of whether or not we're going to use high and tight or that one to three inches above the location. Now, we've got to apply hemostatic dressings on the right side here. If you are regionally approved and you do have hemostatic dressings, that can be an option that you can use along with your direct pressure initially to help control the bleeding. After that, just as the other side went, assure that there's airway, breathing, and circulation is adequate. Assess for hypotension and continue to assess during transport, taking your vials at least every five minutes and transporting to the appropriate hospital. And a few note boxes at the bottom. We've already discussed most of this information here already, but it's transporting to the appropriate uh, facility, maybe a trauma center, maintaining the patient's warmth, watching for hypoperfusion, documenting everything. The regional option, if you're a tactical response team for junctional tourniquets and cutaneous closure devices. And talking about if the tourniquet is placed, an alert patient may require narcotic analgesia, as we discussed, and also the hemodialysis access sites. There was one question on here from somebody who uh, did say it where the placement's going to be, if it's going to be um, over the artery proximal to the wound. It's going to be above the wound site. And again, we're talking about extremities at this point. Uh, it's going to be above the wound site, closer to the trunk of the body, one to three inches above the site. And the 90-minute, two-hour window is really kind of a, a general idea. Most tourniquets are not to be left on for more than two hours. But if you really think that it's going to be an extended time of 90 minutes or more, go ahead and um, contact medical control and get their advice because they may want you to loosen it a little bit occasionally to try and prevent some of the um, side effects such as compartment syndrome. So it's, it's kind of a general number, but in most of the literature, they're never left on for more than two hours. Uh, that's the cutoff point, no pun intended, but um, 90 minutes really should be your but you're looking at a window here. And I think in most cases, we're looking at far less than an hour um, for these patients that we're going to be dealing with them.
Uh, some of you did just ask how uh, we're going to use um, or control bleeding from the femoral artery. Um, that's really going to be direct pressure, and you can use, if you're, if you're approved regionally, a junctional tourniquet, which is used primarily for the femoral areas and areas that are very close to the trunk of the body and the joint areas. Um, but for the most part, that's going to be direct pressure um, throughout the transport. There's some end notes here. These are some websites and articles and studies that we use for its presentation, as well as was used during the TAGS report, and some additional resources for you to look up afterwards. And again, this is all on the PDF version of this webinar that you can look at later, and you can feel free to look up this information on there. So we're going to move on now to the spinal injury protocol. And I will answer one other question that was, came up here real quick on the hemorrhage. It says, is this any of this based on PHTLS? Yes, to a degree it is. Um, PHTLS information was used by the TAG. Um, we also used a lot of New York State data from trauma centers. Actually, New York State has some of the best trauma data in the country, if not the world. And we've had a lot of other states come to New York State to actually access our trauma data because we have a very good trauma registry that has a lot of good information on it that even the CDC and PHTLS and other places don't have. But this pretty much does follow P PHTLS with some small variations. All right, so we'll move on to the spinal protocol here. And as with the hammer protocol, this was done through a tag composed of members of the CMAC. Uh, it was headed by Dr. Joe Bart from the Wyoming Erie Regional e EMS Council. State Trauma Advisory Council also had input on this, and the SEMSCO went ahead and approved uh, the changes to the protocol. So this protocol that we're going to discuss now is actually all done and approved. Real quick on the objective, we're going to, once you're done with this, you'll be prepared to utilize the updated New York State BLS protocol that incorporates the use of spinal motion restriction versus the traditional spinal mobilization that we're all used to. This is going to be a, more of a philosophical change for a lot of people. This is a huge change in philosophy for most of our EMS providers out there, uh, especially those of us who have been around for a long time. We've had backboarding pounded into our heads for over 40 years, and now we're going to be looking at spinal mobilization in a much different way and a better way. So now more than ever before, we need to really keep an open mind and learn from the studies and the medical data that the TAG reviewed and be better patient care providers. There's some other objectives here. I'm not going to go through all of these. These are primarily here for you to use because of your CME renewal um, so you know what objectives that were actually covered and your CIC can review these objectives to make sure that um, you completed what you're supposed to. We are going to have psychomotor objectives. That's the skills stations that are going to be done. There's a skills portion to the CME. That document is also in the course materials section that you were able to get back onto later if you want to through the registration or the uh, webinar link. And that is not a testing station. That is a group scenario-based type training. It's additional training. They're in a format that may look like a practical skill station, but it's not testing. It's supposed to be done in a much more different uh, laid-back environment, and we'll talk more about that later. So additional psychomotor objectives, and then, of course, the affective objectives. Again, this is perhaps the most difficult portion of the CME is really getting the provider to put their mind and wrap it around what spinal motion restriction is versus spinal immobilization and why we're actually doing this. Um, there's been a lot of articles out there over the past few years about this. Some places have already initiated this. Um, some states that we've been working with initiated this probably over the last year or two, and we've kind of learned from their mistakes and their good points that they've had throughout implementation and put it into this webinar and our protocol as well. So, are we going back in time? Well, to a certain degree, yeah, we are. But we're going back in time because of the scientific evidence that we didn't have back then, but that we do have now. We're not just changing the protocol. We're, again, changing in mindset, a technique that has been reinforced in all of us for over 40 years. So for many EMS providers, 
it will be an uphill battle to change the way we have done things for decades. Some research has shown that it takes up to 17 years for EMS providers to fully learn, embrace, and practice a new skill. In New York State, we studied this when the critical care trauma curriculum was rolled out in the 1980s. At that time, we found that it took a minimum of five to six years to get all EMS providers on the same page and utilizing the techniques and information that were in that curriculum. So hold on. Don't throw out your backboards yet. Um, don't use them for sliding boards or uh, go surfing with them or make a bench out of them just quite yet uh, because we're still going to be using them in some aspects. But if for those of us who have been around for quite a while, we also know that history tends to repeat itself. And just because something goes away doesn't mean it won't come back um, at a later date, i.e. mass bans and some other things that we've had over the years. So hold on to your backboards. Don't throw them in the, in the dumpster quite yet. The previous protocol in 2008 uh, was rolled out with a PowerPoint presentation and some ancillary documents. However, it was found that the, a lot of the training changed quite a bit at the local level, which caused a lot of confusion amongst the providers. The protocol at that time was based on science that we had available to us in 2008, and a lot of help from the state of Maine's EMS medical director. Maine had a successful spinal program, program after some initial bumps in the road. That protocol from 2008 was designed to reduce the emphasis on mechanism of injury and shifted more to the patient's complaints and your assessment findings. This should have reduced the usage of spinal mobilization in theory. However, the protocol actually had little effect on provider patients and um, provider practice, and patients were still being spinal mobilized, if not more than they were before. Why is that? Well, there were a lot of QA and QI committees that were still requiring spinal mobilization based on mechanism of injury and other factors. Also, providers were afraid of being sued if they didn't use spinal mobilization. And we all know how a litigious state New York is in, in the society right now. So a lot of providers just said, you know what, I'm going to play it safe and just put them on the backboard. But as we're going to discuss down the road here in this presentation, that could actually be doing more harm than good. Emergency room staff did not understand the reduced usage of spinal mobilization by EMS. This is why it's very important for the regional councils and your local medical directors to keep an open mind of communication with your local emergency departments so that they're aware of the changes that are coming down through. It's difficult for us at the state level to reach out to all of the hospitals and emergency departments. We don't have regulatory authority over them. So this is really done better at the local level by the physicians, the REMAC, the REMSCOs, and even you guys reaching out to the uh, nurses and physicians at your local hospital. Also, there was just an over, um, overall lack of communication between providers as well as instructors and medical directors, which caused very little changes in that 2008 protocol. Hopefully, a lot of that will be lessened through this presentation and this protocol. We've been using spinal mobilization for a very long time. So why all of a sudden are we stopping? Well, there have been several studies performed on the use of backboards, and some of the results are seen here on this slide. I don't think we've ever had a patient say that they were comfortable on the backboard, especially after suffering a traumatic injury. Sometimes it's just been easier for EMS to put the patient on a backboard to move them from point A to point B and get them on your stretcher. The studies are showing that the risks and costs are outweighing the positive outcomes of the use of backboards. Once a patient is on a backboard, in many instances, they would be left on the backboard for several hours until a hospital cleared their spine injuries and removed them from the board. This is especially bad for our geriatric patients who can begin to develop skin ulcerations within minutes due to the pressure of their body against a hard surface such as a backboard. Ulcerations on patients can lead to sepsis and even death, not to mention that they're extremely painful. With over 97% of cervical spine x-rays showing no spinal injury and only a fraction of the remaining 3% having an unstable spinal injury, we are subjecting most of our patients to unnecessary radiation. 
The cost is also very high to the healthcare system with costs exceeding $175 million annually just for these x-rays. Now you may say that this is a problem for the hospitals and not for EMS, but we, EMS, are a part of the total healthcare system. We are not fixing a hospital problem. We are working together to assure good total patient care with positive outcomes for our patients. We need to remember, first, do no harm. Just because we saw one patient have an unstable spinal injury doesn't mean we have to backboard all of our patients. We can become better educated, thereby becoming better patient care providers. The new protocol will hopefully be better understood and more appropriately used than the previous protocol. The changes that are reflected in the 2015 protocol results from the review of several studies as well as the NEXUS National Emergency X-ray Utilization Study criteria and the work of the SENSCO TAG that has been reviewing the current science, research, and literature that's been out there. The NEXUS study has been out there for quite a while and actually most hospitals are very aware of the NEXUS study. The criteria now allows for the use of a cervical collar without utilizing a backboard. It also introduces the concept of spinal motion restriction. We now need to start thinking outside the box more than ever before. So yes, you will have a patient that will come to the emergency room in a rigid cervical collar and probably, most likely, not on a backboard, something that's very new for us. So what is spinal motion restriction? Well, spinal immobilization is the act of securing a patient to the spine board, either short or long, and not allowing any movement. Spinal motion restriction is not restricting all patient movement, but really limiting the patient movement to reduce excess movement of the patient's spinal column. So we're not trying to stop them from totally moving. We just are trying to stop any gross movement that may increase the likelihood of injury to their spinal column. A long backboard can be utilized to move the patient to the stretcher if necessary, but the patient should be removed from the long backboard prior to initiating transport. Removing the patient from the long backboard will be discussed later in the presentation. Spinal motion restriction is designed, again, to reduce gross movement of the patient and, in particular, their spinal column. With proper spinal motion restriction, you may still have some movement of the patient, but it should be limited to prevent further or additional injury. Proper application of a spinal motion restriction will reduce the negative effects caused by traditional spinal immobilization while still providing appropriate and necessary care to the patient who may have a spinal injury. So yes, we were causing injuries and discomfort to the patients that we were immobilizing many of the times. And a lot of those patients may not have been immobilized correctly. So this is part of the reason we are moving to spinal motion restriction versus the traditional spinal immobilization. Spinal motion restriction still requires ongoing assessments, in fact, probably more than before, which does include motor and sensory function, just as we've done with our backboarding. It is crucial that you make sure the patient understands what you want them to do and not to do during this process. Explain the process to them and make sure they understand it. Again, just like we did when we were putting on a KED or a long backboard or any other device. So let's review the protocol and then we'll discuss some of the ways we're going to utilize spinal motion restriction in some of our more common scenarios. No substantial changes here. This section pertains to those patients with penetrating trauma meeting the major trauma protocol or those patients with blood trauma not meeting the major trauma protocol. So no real changes here in this first section to the current protocol. Next, we've got six criteria that we're going to look at. The first one is altered mental state. Any patient with a Glasgow coma scale below 15, that would be a positive finding. Um, there's a lot of discussion, there's been a lot of discussion in uh, research, PHTLS, and other places about whether or not to use the GCS of 14, but the committee really looked at it and wanted to keep it at 15. So it's any patient, again, using common sense, if you come up to them and their eyes are closed and they're just resting, that doesn't mean that they're a GCS of 14, as long as they're able to communicate with you appropriately, they could be a GCS of 15. So we're really looking at anybody who's below 
a GCS of 15. Or number two, a complaint of neck or spine pain or tenderness. Number three, weakness, tingling or numbness of the trunk or extremities at any time after the injury. So this is not something that they would have had prior to this incident. This is something new that's happened. They could have medical conditions before the incident, and then the incident actually aggravated it, which did cause some numbness and tingling or loss of movement. Number four is deformity of the spine that was not present prior to the injury or incident. And number five, the big one, distracting injury or circumstances. Distracting injuries are very subjective for EMS providers to determine. What is distracting to the patient may not be distracting to you or I, especially in that moment. Distracting injuries are usually any injury, physical or emotional, that takes the patient's attention away from another injury that the EMS provider is more concerned with. So even the trauma of the event could cause a distracting incident to what their injury is. So we, it doesn't just have to be a specific injury. It could be the event itself. Um, we've seen patients who can walk around with fractured arms and, and be in very little pain because they're in shock. So you look at all five of those plus the sixth one here, high risk mechanism of injury associated with unstable spinal injuries that include, and they're not limited to, are axial load injuries, which are usually their diving accidents or spear tackle sporting injuries in the football or soccer. High speed vehicle crashes, they're very dependent on many factors, including the type of the vehicle, the safety accessories, what was struck, et cetera. Pedestrian and bicycle collisions, which have similar subjective issues, such as the speed of the vehicles, what they actually hit. And also a fall of more than three feet or approximately five stairs, or the patient's height. Again, it's dependent on other factors as well, but these can all be used as general guidelines. So we're looking at all six of these things within this protocol. If a spine injury is suspected, the patient should be placed in a properly fitted rigid cervical collar and spinal movement minimized. Patients without any of the above findings, one through six, may be transported without the use of a cervical collar or any other means to restrict spinal movement without the use of a backboard. So if they meet any of the criteria, one through six, you can put a collar on, and just utilize the collar unless there's other circumstances where you have to use a long board, which we'll discuss later. And if they don't have any of those items one through six, you don't even need to put the collar on. Uh, somebody did ask a question here um, about patients with dementia. That's a very, very good question. And it really depends on their extent of dementia, whether or not they're alert to things around them. Um, You'd probably err on the safe side with those patients and at least put them in a collar. Again, we're not going to be mobilizing them on a lawn board like we do traditionally, but probably the use of a collar would be good. But again, it depends on the patient and the extent of their dementia. The lawn backboard and shortboard devices are still utilized, but as extrication and patient moving devices, not as transportation devices. Spinal motion restriction can be accomplished for some patients with only a cervical collar and securing them to the ambulance stretcher. Yes, again, this does mean that you may be arriving at the hospital with somebody in a cervical collar with no backboard and just on your sheets and blankets in the ambulance. Caution must be used by higher level care providers who arrive on the scene and spinal motion restriction has already been initiated, but they feel that it's not necessary. So for example, if a CFR or EMT is first responding and then a paramedic comes in and that EMT or CFR has already started spinal motion restriction, there should be a discussion between the two of them if or whether or not it needs to be continued. If the first EMS provider found it necessary to begin spinal motion restriction, both providers should get together to discuss why it was initiated and how to proceed along with a thorough patient assessment. Don't just come in and say they don't need that let's stop holding it and holding stabilization and spinal motion restriction. They can get up and get on the stretcher. Discuss it first. The highest level of care provider who feels spinal motion restriction should be stopped should also be the provider who accompanies the patient to the hospital. 
This should be fully documented as to the start and the cessation of spinal motion restriction. For transporting a patient from one hospital to another hospital and they are already on a backboard, the EMS provider in charge should discuss with the sending physician the use of spinal motion restriction instead of spinal immobilization. However, the sending physician is in charge of that patient and the treatment for that patient. So if that sending physician wants the patient left on the long board, then you're going to have to leave them on the long board. But you should discuss the optional use of spinal motion restriction to get them off of the backboard uh, because the prolonged use of the backboard, again, can be very detrimental to a lot of our patients. Okay, next, here we have a, a quick video. And this will be just like before, you may have the audio off a little bit from the video, but it's discussing the proper sizing and application of the cervical collar, which we tend to be a little bit off of sometimes. I think we've all seen providers just slap a collar on without measuring it. This video will demonstrate the technique of measuring, sizing, and applying a cervical collar. While this video shows a particular brand of cervical collar for demonstration purposes, the principles of sizing and application remain the same regardless of the product chosen for use by an individual service. It is the responsibility of each provider to be familiar with the specifics of the product in use in his or her service. The first provider initiates manual neutral inline stabilization of the patient's head and neck. The second provider uses his or her fingers to measure the distance between the patient's lower jaw and shoulder. The provider uses this measurement to select a properly sized collar or to set an adjustable collar to the correct size. If an adjustable collar is used, the provider must make sure the collar is locked into the proper size. The second provider applies the properly sized collar while the first provider maintains the neutral inline head and neck stabilization until the patient is secured to an immobilization device. Specific patient populations, such as extremes of age and size, may require additional padding and support in order to maintain adequate alignment and comfort. So that's pretty basic on instructions and how to put a rigid, rigid cervical collar in place. Um, you may have patients who are obese who, or pediatric patients even that you don't have a properly sized collar for. So you have to be prepared to utilize either some towels to wrap around the patient's neck or head area to try and immobilize it. But overall, you really saw no difference in this video than what we're going to be doing under this new protocol. You're still going to be stabilizing the head just as we did for the traditional mobilization and putting the collar on. But now we're just calling it spinal motion restriction and getting the collar in place. And that collar is going to aid in the patient really self-administering spinal motion restriction. And some of you have asked some questions on here, and most of those questions are going to be answered later on throughout the presentation. But if they're not, then you can just re-ask them again at the end. But no matter what kind of collar you're using, uh, it should be a, a rigid cer a cervical collar. You've got to read the directions from the manufacturer. You have to know the exact way that they want it measured to place on your patient. Um, it should be, sounds pretty easy, but you'd be surprised what you may find in the manufacturer's instructions for these items. So this is the protocol here. This is the approved protocol, and we're going to go through each step. As you can see, the protocol is in a flowchart format. We're working on cleaning up all the current protocols, and as we move them forward, we're going to be producing them in flowchart format uh, as much as we can. There are some protocols we can't do that with, but we're going to try and clean these up and make them a little bit more user-friendly these days. So in this first section here, does the patient meet the adult major trauma criteria with blunt mechanism of injury, uh, like T6 or T7? Can you move on to that? Either yes or no. Uh, if yes, go on the left side. Spine injury should be suspected, and the patient should be placed in a properly fitted cervical collar and spinal movement minimized. If no, that's when we move into our six criteria and look at things such as altered mental state, complaint of neck or back pain, weakness, tingling, or numbness in the trunk or extremities, deformity of the spinal column, 
painful, distracting injuries, and then again, our mechanism of injury and the high risk mechanism of injuries. And again, a lot of this is subjective except for the signs and symptoms that you're going to see in these six items. But if you notice, again, mechanism of injury is step number six, where prior to even 2008, it was always the first step. We were downplaying the mechanism of injury and looking more at what you're finding during your assessment and what the patient's complaints are. Then once you come out of there, uh, whether that they do or they don't have any of these six items, if they don't, patients without any of the above findings may be transported without the use of a collar or any other means for, to restrict spinal motion. So very simple, very straightforward, pretty much everything that we said earlier, and just in a flowchart format. And at the bottom, you've got a note box here, which talks about most of the items we already discussed. And if you look through here, we've got, again, um, spinal movement can be minimized by application of a properly fitted rigid uh, cervical collar and securing the patient to the stretcher, which we'll talk more about in a little while. And we discussed all of these items on here already, so I'm not going to repeat them. But the long spine board, as it says here, is next to last bullet, is only one of multiple modalities, modalities that can be utilized to minimize spinal movement. Electing not to use a long spine board will not constitute a deviation from the standard of care. So your standard of care is what you're taught and what the current protocol is. If you go by your current protocol, you're within your standard of care that you're certified under. So let's talk a little bit about some of the high-risk patients that may make it a little bit more difficult for us. We need to be able to know who our high-risk patients are for spinal injuries. It's really any patient with a disease or an illness that affects bone structure and or density, they are at a higher risk for spinal fractures. Geriatric patients tend to have lower bone densities as well as some curvature of the spinal column. Patients who have osteoporosis have weaker and more brittle bones. Patients with a genetic disorder, trisomy 21, which causes Down syndrome, have a higher likelihood of having decreased stability in the function of cervical vertebrae C1 and C2, your first two vertebrae in your neck. This can lead to increased risk for fractures in the area of C1 and C2. This is found more often in children than adults. The picture on this slide shows a patient with an instability and an injury at the junction of C1 and C2. This was a patient who did have Down syndrome. Usually these at-risk patients tend to have non-displaced fractures, but not always. So most spinal fractures are compression type fractures. They're not displaced fractures, as we see here on the left side of the screen. Rarely does a patient, I apologize, we'll go back one. Rarely does a patient have a displaced fracture that is severe enough to cause a spinal cord injury, as we can see in the x-ray on the right-hand side of the screen. So really, if, you had, if this was your patient, is immobilizing the patient on a long backboard with a compression factor really going to do much for that patient? No. It's spinal motion restriction and reducing gross movement is going to prevent further injury and also make the patient more comfortable and to be able to stay in a position of more comfort and lessening the pain. The patient on the right, again, it is so rare that we will find a patient with a displacement like this um, that's not a, just a compression fracture that spinal motion restriction should be utilized and just extra care if we do find numbness, tingling, and so forth to the extremities. So how will you handle your patients who are found standing or walking around? Standing takedown is no longer utilized for patients found in the standing position. Care must be taken to initiate and maintain spinal motion restriction when appropriate. Proper application of a rigid cervical collar should be completed prior to moving the patient. Patients should be assisted to the stretcher and properly secured to the stretcher following your stretcher manufacturer's instructions. So let's discuss some of the more common ways you will find your patients and how we're going to deal with those patients. When you find your patient in a standing position, you still need to communicate with them as to what you're going to do. You are really assisting the patient with spinal motion restriction of their head and neck at this point. 
Initially, hold manual cervical stabilization of the head and neck, then place the patient in the appropriately sized cervical collar, as you see here in these pictures. So really, no change from what we're used to from before. Place the stretcher behind the patient so there is limited movement of the patient to get them onto the stretcher. This is really where our first big change is going to occur. No longer doing a standing takedown, no longer laying them on a backboard. We're going to allow them and assist them to sit down and try to restrict their spinal motion as much as possible. So assist your patient to sit on the stretcher while maintaining spinal motion restriction. Depending on your patient, their ability to follow directions appropriately, and of course, your assessment findings, all will play a role in how much assistance you will need to give your patient to get them onto the stretcher. For example, a patient with signs of a concussion may need to have instructions repeated to them and additional assistance to have them sit down on the stretcher. Again, you are really assisting your patient to get on the stretcher. Holding the patient's head will assist in maintaining spinal motion restriction. Some patients may not need you to hold their head and some may need you to help them, but it really depends on your patient. Most patients with neck or back pain are going to self-splint themselves and reduce the motion anyways. Try to keep your patient from bending their spinal column, maintaining spinal motion restriction while laying them down. Most of your patients will probably be more comfortable in a sitting position, usually a 45 or 90 degree angle. Each patient and circumstance will be different but sometimes it may not be necessary to lay your patient down to a full supine position. In fact, that could be doing them more harm. It makes it more difficult to breathe and increases pain on the injury sites. So many of these patients will be sitting up at a 45 or 90 degree angle in a collar, no backboard when you arrive at the hospital. Once your patient is laying on the stretcher, you can stop holding their head, but you still need to instruct the patient to not move their head and try to remain as still as possible. Following your stretcher manufacturer's guidelines, place the stretcher safety belts on the patient. As you see here on these pictures, this stretcher comes with a harness type safety belt for the upper body. This will not only improve patient safety, but also help in maintaining spinal motion restriction by limiting how the patient can move. So what about seated patients? Well, the first thing is to manually stabilize the cervical spine and explain to the patient what you're going to do, just as we did before, and apply the appropriately sized cervical collar. I think you can understand the theme that's going on here. As long as your assessment doesn't reveal injuries or disentanglement issues, you can assist the patient from their current seated position, like a chair or a car seat, to the stretcher, but you need to maintain spinal motion restriction to limit gross movement of the patient's spine. Shortboard devices can be used, but only for safely moving a patient while maintaining spinal motion restriction. In some instances, like extensive damage to the vehicle, altered mental status, or patient intoxication, it might be better to place them in a shortboard device because they can't safely remove themselves from their environment without moving their spinal column. The long backboard can be utilized as a slide board or to move the patient from their current seated position to the ambulance stretcher, but the patient should not be transported on the long backboard. If possible, you can remove the patient from the seated position directly to the ambulance stretcher without the use of a long board, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Each patient and circumstance, again, is gonna be different, but if your patient has an isolated neck injury, it might be possible to have the patient sitting up on the stretcher at a 45 or 90 degree angle with a collar in place and tra transporting them that way. This will be your call for your patient. As long as spinal motion restriction is maintained, you're good. So when you find your patient in a seated position, let's say against an object such as a wall, you will need to begin holding their head from the front. So you're holding head stabilization from the front of the patient. Depending on your patient and their circumstances, they may be able to stand up with only a little assistance from you or even on their own. However, some patients may need additional help, not only from two or more providers, but to the use of a shortboard device, such as we see here with the KED. In this situation, the KED was applied as you normally would, which provides additional handles for the EMS provider to grasp and to assist them in standing the patient in an upright position. 
This may be a useful technique for a patient, again, with altered mental state. The shortboard device should be removed from the patient. Patients should not be transported in a shortboard device unless it's absolutely necessary. Once you lay them on the stretcher, you can loosen and remove all straps and unloosen the device, the head and the chest area, as well as the pelvic straps as well. Now you can slide the device from behind the patient while maintaining spinal motion restriction. Another option is to remove the device while the patient is standing in the standing position and before they are actually placed on the stretcher. But it's going to really depend on whether or not that patient is awake and alert enough and can stand and you can safely remove it before you get on the stretcher. Finding a patient sitting in a chair is a little bit easier to handle, of course. You can hold the annual stabilization of the cervical spine from the patient's posterior side, place the appropriately sized cervical collar, and assist the patient to the standing position. In these pictures, the patient needed quite a bit of assistance through the use of an EMS provider on each side of the patient. Most of our patients will probably only need one provider to assist them, but each circumstance, again, is going to be different. But don't be afraid to use a couple providers just to assist them in standing so they don't move around too much. Motor vehicle crashes have additional challenges for us, just as they have when we utilize the traditional spinal immobilization techniques. Remember, the goal is to reduce movement of the patient's spinal column. Keep that in mind when you develop your plan for removing the patient from the vehicle. Manually stabilize the cervical spine and apply the appropriate size cervical collar. As we see in this picture, a provider is sitting in the back seat, was able to place the collar on and hold stabilization. Some patients may be able to self-extricate from the vehicle with little assistance from EMS providers, but you still need to make sure the patient is limiting movement of their spinal column. As we see here, cervical stabilization is transferred to the EMS provider standing outside and in front of the vehicle, uh, in front of the patient as they swing their legs out of the vehicle. In the third picture, you see that this vehicle has a very low roof line, and the patient almost needs to bend forward to stand up out of the vehicle. Try to avoid this so you can maintain spinal motion restriction as best as possible. So there may still be a circumstance, depending on the patient and the damage to the vehicle, where you still may need to take the roof off because it's such a small compartment area and a low roof line that you can't even stand them up without having them bend their upper back or even their neck. Once the patient is standing up outside of the vehicle, assist them to the stretcher and lay them down as we discussed earlier. And again, each patient is going to be a little bit different how much assistance we're going to need. For those patients that cannot self-extricate or stand up with assistance, you may need to remove them from the vehicle in a more traditional way. Here we see the stretcher placed up against the vehicle and the patient is slid longitudinally out of the vehicle and onto the stretcher. One problem you will most likely have with this technique is that the sheets of the blankets on the stretcher will slide too much and you won't have enough of them under the patient to safely transfer them once you get to the hospital. The sheets and the blankets will also cause additional friction that will make your job even more difficult to move the patient. Another way to remove the patient from the vehicle is to utilize a long backboard. In this technique, the long backboard is utilized more as a slide board device and not an immobilization device. In this scenario, the long backboard is placed under the patient's buttocks and the patient is guided out of the vehicle to sit on the long backboard and then lay down onto the long board. Again, the patient is then laid down on the long backboard and slid up to the top of the board. Now you can either slide the patient from the long board and onto the stretcher, as you see here, or as we will discuss in the next slide, you can place the long backboard on the stretcher as you have normally done with traditional spinal mobilization. We're going to discuss how you remove the patient from the long board and transfer them at the hospital in a few minutes. Supine patients, those patients found laying on their back, again, manually stabilize the cervical spine, apply the appropriately sized cervical collar, and there's numerous ways to move a patient from the supine position to the stretcher. Each patient encounter will be different, and which device you decide to use is dependent on your scene survey and patient assessment.
One of the easiest devices to use is a scoop type stretcher. This allows you to move the patient as a solid unit while maintaining spinal motion restriction. Long backboards, sheet moves, lift and carry moves, log rolls can also be used. You need to make the call based on what you see and are able to do while maintaining spinal motion restriction. Prone patients are those patients who are found in a face down position or are lateral recumbent patients, those patients found laying down on their left or right side. Same thing goes here. Manually stabilize, apply the appropriately assigned cervical collar, and as with the supine patient, there is no one single way to accomplish getting your patient onto the stretcher. Log rolling the patient onto a long board may be the easiest, safest, and quickest way to do it. You could also log roll the patient and utilize the scoop stretcher. Again, as long as you can safely move the patient while maintaining spinal motion restriction, you should be fine. You'll need to make the call for each circumstance that you have. Here we see some examples of scoop type stretchers. A scoop stretcher is ideal for moving a supine patient from one point to another. It can be split in half, placed around the patient, secured, and then the patient lifted while maintaining spinal motion restriction with very little, if any, movement of the patient. However, care needs to be taken to follow the device's manufacturer guidelines for the use and the securing of the patient to the device. Before falling out of favor years ago, the scoop was used to be a first-line device for many patient moves, especially patients with fractured hips. This is one reason they are also called orthopedic stretchers. For those of you who have been around for a long time, you probably remember when we used to scoop, use the scoop stretchers before we even had backboards. For short transport times, you could leave the patient on the scoop stretcher during the transport, thereby assisting with moving the patient from the ambulance stretcher to the hospital stretcher while maintaining spinal motion restriction. For longer transport times, it may be better for the patient to be removed from the scoop and then reapply it at the hospital or utilize a traditional sheet move as long as spinal motion restriction can be maintained. You need to follow your manufacturer's guidelines for use. In your skills portion of the training, you'll review the different components of the scoop stretcher as well as demonstrate how it is used according to the manufacturer's guidelines for that specific device. There's a lot of newer type scoop stretchers out there these days and you've got to make sure that you understand how that manufacturer wants you to utilize that particular scoop stretcher. There's many different ones out there. Vacuum splints are another device that can be utilized to transport patients while maintaining spinal motion restriction. However, it may not be the most appropriate device depending on the patient's injuries, condition, and ongoing assessment needs. Once you get the patient in this device, you may not be able to adequately reassess and do an ongoing assessment of the back of the patient or their head. Since we no longer should be transporting spinal injury patients on long backboards, what happens when you decide that the best way to move a patient from point A to your stretcher is by placing them on a long board? How do you remove the patient from the long backboard? There's no one solution that fits every situation. However, some of these techniques on the slide that you see here could be useful. Every EMT course teaches proper lifting and moving techniques, which can be used as the basis for these techniques. Each technique shown here has its pluses and minuses. This is why you need to practice different techniques in different situations to determine what works best for you and your patient for the environment that you're in. In these pictures, we see the crew utilizing the log roll technique to remove the long backboard from the patient when the long backboard is placed on the stretcher. This technique is not suggested for all patients. Our stretchers are very narrow, which makes it difficult to utilize this technique, especially for larger patients. But this patient was small enough to allow the log roll technique to be utilized safely and remove the long backboard. Another technique is to hold the patient in place and slide the long backboard out from under the patient. This isn't something that you can do in the back of an ambulance, so think ahead of time and do this prior to loading the patient in the ambulance. As we learned with traditional spinal mobilization, you may need to add padding to fill voids, especially with the elderly patients. 
The same holds true when utilizing spinal motion restriction when you place the patient on your stretcher. I think we can all be in agreement that our stretcher pads uh, are not very soft and thereby not conforming to all the patient voids. Even if the patient does not have kyphosis or curvature of the spine, they will most likely need some degree of padding. Pediatric patients will most likely require about an inch of padding between their torso and the stretcher as seen here in these pictures. Remember that children tend to have larger occipital regions of their skull than adults do, which causes flexion of their head and neck and could cause airway issues, not to mention increased risk for cervical spinal injury. Regardless of which stretcher you use, you need to know what your stretcher manufacturer's requirements are for properly securing your patient to that stretcher. When utilizing spinal motion restriction properly, securing your patient to the stretcher is crucial. Improperly securing your patient to the stretcher not only places the patient at risk for further injury, reduce the effectiveness of spinal motion restriction, but you may be held liable if you did not follow the manufacturer's requirements for safely belting the patient in. Now, what happens when you get to the hospital? Well, moving a patient on a long backboard from your stretcher to the hospital stretcher is much easier to maintain spinal motion restriction if they're on a long backboard. It's easier, it's quicker, and that's kind of what we're used to. So great care needs to be taken when transferring patients from your stretcher to the hospital stretcher when you don't have the luxury of having a long backboard there. Moving these patients is a new skill that we all need to learn and practice. The lifting and moving techniques we were taught during the NT school did not take into consideration spinal motion restriction. This is why you need to practice the skill and plan ahead with every patient transfer to assure you properly move the patient while maintaining spinal motion restriction. During the transfer, you still must keep spinal motion restriction in place. The patient has to be moved as a unit. There is no single transfer or maneuver that fits every patient or every situation. However, there are some common techniques that can be used on all of your patients. Friction reduction devices can make your transfer go much more smoothly. On this uh, in these pictures here, these are some examples of some commercially made slide boards, also known as friction reducing devices. As you can see in the picture on the left of your screen, the slide board straddles both beds, but there is no gap in between the beds. Slide boards should not be used to bridge a gap between two beds or stretchers. Hospitals, especially the radiology departments, have utilized slide boards for a very long time. And I think we've all seen slide boards in the emergency room. By the time you reach the hospital, you should have already had a plan in mind of how you're going to transfer your, transfer your patient. Part of that plan is knowing how many people you will need to appropriately transfer the patient while still maintaining spinal motion restriction. A minimum of three people should be involved in the transfer. One patient, excuse me, one at the patient's head, one on the patient's left side, and one on the patient's right side. Just like we learned when we log roll a patient onto a long backboard, this is a team effort to transfer these patients. Having the adequate number of people to assist in the transfer will assure a safe transfer. Failure to plan ahead and have enough help could cause loss of spinal motion restriction causing pain and or injury to the patient and or injury to EMS personnel and others who are assisting in the transfer. Not only do you need to assure that both stretchers are at the proper height, but they should be at a height that works for everyone on the transfer team to assure proper body mechanics during the transfer. Let gravity work in your favor. Keep your stretcher slightly higher than the hospital stretcher for the transfer. Some things to keep in mind. Reposition the assistance if necessary. Just because somebody's in the wrong spot doesn't mean you should keep them there. That make sure everybody is in the correct position. Keep your body stacked and straight. Avoid twists and awkward positions of your body. Keep the weight as close to your body as possible when preparing to move the patient. Never use your back muscles to lift or move the patient. And when reaching, reach no more than 15 to 20 inches in front of your body. So if you're utilizing a sheet move, you need to make sure that the sheet is nice and taut and tight under the patient 
So you're rolling the sheet up to make sure you're nice and close to the patient, and that way bringing the patient's weight closer to your body. And if the sheet is nice and tight underneath the patient, you should have a good, smooth transfer of the patient. So just as we were taught where to place the backboard straps on the patient's body, the same goes for transferring the patient. Assuring hands are at the patient's head, shoulders, hips, and knees will help you to move the patient as a unit. In this picture, we see how staff is transferring the patient using a slide board and proper lifting and sliding technique. The patient is transferred as, a, as one unit. Notice how one provider is managing the patient's head while one provider is on each side of the patient at the shoulder and the hips. There is also an additional provider who is off screen at the feet and the knees assisting with the moving of the patient's legs. On this slide, on the picture on the left is showing a proper transfer technique with three people. On the side, they are moving the patient towards, and two on the side where the patient is being moved from. The picture on the right is, of course, a poor technique, not just because she is reaching to do it herself, but she's reaching too far in front of her and setting herself up for a back injury, and of the patient possibly rolling away from her and off of the stretcher. Now the skills portion of this is going to be done locally. Uh, we designed the skills portion to be done by a New York State CIC, CLI, or physician medical director in some cases. New York State certified instructors have the education and background to develop classes and curricula to be implemented locally to meet their local needs. Agencies who do not have a readily available CIC or CLI should reach out to their respective regional EMS councils or core sponsor for assistance in finding some of the appropriate instructional staff. Those agencies, who, again, who are affiliated themselves with the CIC for their CME renewal program should reach out to that CIC first. Since this skill is a huge change with no one single perfect sequence to complete, there will be variations at the local level. This will take repeated practice for many of us to get the skill down and be able to adapt it to the ever-changing conditions and environment that we find our patients in. Attendance records for all the providers who receive the training must be documented and kept on file at the agency level or at the regional level, wherever the training is going to be done. And in closing, again, the New York State Practical Skills Exam will not be changing at this time. We may be making some future changes to the Practical Skills Exam, but since we are really trying to stay with the national model of the current standards and National Registry skill stations, we aren't going to make a move until either they do or we develop something a little bit different for New York. Now, we hope that this webinar was helpful to you and that we made it easier for you to obtain the information. This is the first time we've done this type of statewide training. We hope to continue and improve the ways we can get the information out to you, the provider, the instructor, and all the other EMS entities that we need to reach out to. Please make sure that you individually register for either this webinar or the recorded version, and you can log into the WebEx to complete your 25-question assessment for this webinar. You will receive an email, again, from WebEx with your grade. Hold on to that because you need to file that and prove that you did attend and pass the quiz. You'll also receive a certificate of completion from the from New York State Bureau of EMS for three hours of CME. That takes into consideration tonight's webinar and the skills portion that you're going to be doing locally. And those certificates will sure hopefully be out in the early part of September once everybody's pretty much done with this. So thank you for attending tonight. I know you've all got very busy lives, and um, there's a, been some great questions back and forth. And I would like to uh, encourage anybody, if they want to ask questions now, they can. And if you want to stay and listen to some of the questions and answers, that's feel free to. If not, um, bid you a farewell and have a good evening and stay safe out there. For the rest of you that want to stay on for a little bit, I will take some questions here for a little while. One question is, when do the protocols take effect? Um, everybody should have this done by October 30th. And if your agency has everybody done before that, then your agency can go online with the new protocol. So you don't have to wait until October 30th or November to actually start. So it's, it's also up to your agency's medical director 
and your train officer at your agency to determine if everybody is all set to go. And if you are, go ahead and start using it. Does anybody else have any other questions or anything that we didn't cover during the webinar? Again, this webinar or a separate webinar will be recorded and we're going to send out the link to the recording so that people that couldn't register for tonight or any of the future webinars can watch it anytime, anywhere. Uh, there was discussion, uh, somebody asked did we show a prone patient. We didn't actually show one on the screen. We did talk about the prone patient and log rolling them into the supine position or, and utilizing a scoop stretcher or long backboard to move them on to the ambulance stretcher. Somebody asked, do head blocks still have a use? As of right now, probably not, but there are still some questions the TAG is going to have to answer, like how do you continually stabilize the patient's head if they're intoxicated, also level of consciousness, while they're on the stretcher and during transport. If you don't have the luxury of having a second provider to be able to hold stabilization, you might be looking at some way of possibly using those um, head blocks and securing them to the stretcher a little bit to improve the um, restriction of the motion of the patient during transport and then releasing them while you're holding stabilization once you get to the hospital. Um, but right now, they haven't discussed really too much what to do with the head immobilizers. Somebody asked, yes, this does take effect in October. Um, Brian asked, um, I often hear providers say immobilize if in doubt. It's better to err on the side of caution. Um, well, the side of caution is now just the opposite. If um, you suspect a spinal injury, spinal motion restriction, according to your protocol, is sufficient enough. Um, you can actually cause more harm by placing a patient on a long backboard and having them left on there during transport and at the hospital. So that was really the, the big issue with the 2008 protocols as well, is people would just say, well, I'm going to err on the side of caution and just put them on the board. Well, now the err on the side of caution is putting them on a collar and restricting their movement. Uh, Donald asked, will transport in a recumbent position be allowed? Yes, if your patient need, can sit at a 45 or 90-degree 90, 90 angle or whatever angle is comfortable for them, that's appropriate. Again, depending on the patient, the situation, and your assessment findings. Uh, Blake, I think I answered that one already, but uh, manual stabilization the entire time, even after the collar is applied, usually not. Again, it depends on your patient if they're able to follow directions and they're alert enough. You sh once you have the collar on, you should be able to let go of the head because the collar is actually going to be taking the place of what your hands were doing and reducing the motion of the neck. Somebody asked, uh, I believe it's Ed here, asked, what about the individuals who become certified as EMTs after this deadline? This uh, information is going to be incorporated into their courses. And the state written exam will have very few changes in it. Um, there's really very little transition that we're going to have to do, but we will have to change some of the items that are on the certification exams, on the written exam, but for the most part, everybody will be fine with that. If something happened, you could not get the protocol off of the course materials, or you could not get the, into the link for the course materials, feel free to email me um, through the registration email that you found, and I will get that out to you. If there is a password for the test, for the quiz, it might be SPINAL2015, all one word. SPINAL2015. Uh, I didn't think there was a password on that, and I'll double check that. If you have difficulty getting into that, let me know now or send me an email and I'll double check that. Very good question here. Do you know if the hospital staff are being educated on this change for EMS? We talked a little bit about that, and that's going to be a very long-term process that's going to need to be done at the regional and local level. Even though we're the state health department, it's difficult because we don't, the Bureau of EMS doesn't regulate hospitals and emergency departments. But through our state trauma advisory council, through our regional EMS councils, our program agencies, they're getting the words out more locally to the emergency departments, especially the trauma centers, of how this is going to 
be rolled out and what to expect from EMS. I think for the most part, it's going to be accepted very quickly, especially by the trauma centers. Um, but just like when we started backboarding, I'm sure somebody is going to be upset because you didn't use a backboard now instead of using one. But again, stay with your protocol. As long as you treat your patient according to your protocol and what you're educated for that protocol, you're good. Uh, and if the hospital still gives you a really hard time, I would refer them to your medical director or have your medical director for your agency contact them and discuss it. And if it's a widespread issue with one or more hospitals in your region, get a hold of your regional council and your REMAC and discuss it with them so they can discuss it more locally. Uh, somebody asked about firefighters as well. This takes effect for anybody who's certified in New York State, ALS or BLS. This is how will providers be updated to this protocol if they are not able to attend one of these webinar sessions. Um, hopefully, they'll be, if they can't get on one of these sessions, the live sessions, they should be able to get on to the recorded one once we send that link out, and that can be done at any time um, and anywhere. So hopefully, they can do it um, via the recorded message one, uh, the recorded session. That can also be downloaded to a, locally to your computer. I know there are some places that say that a lot of other people may not have internet access. Um, I would recommend going to the agency because most all agencies have internet access now. And if that's not possible, try to find someone who can download it and save it for you. But you will also get it in your renewal courses as well as the original courses. If you're still looking for the quiz, you should be able to get to it once you leave this webinar um, and or go back into it via the link to get into the webinar. Um, and you should be able to find it there. You should have also received another email today, and you probably get one tomorrow that gives you a link directly to the quiz as well. There were some questions that came up during the first webinar regarding what do we do with a patient who's on a traction split now? And that was a very good question. That was something that TAG I don't think really looked at yet, and we're going to be discussing that more as we move forward with this new protocol. Um, and there are going to be some patients that, you know what, it's going to be easier for you um, to put them on a long backboard. For example, a patient who is struck by a, a motor vehicle and has multiple extremity fractures, um, and if you're not able to get them into a scoop, it might be easier on a long board at that point. But for the most part, probably 98 to 99% of our patients won't need the backboard to be transported on anyway. Somebody asked what happens if you don't pass the quiz. You get three attempts at it. Uh, please refer back to the PDF document of the PowerPoint so you can uh, find information in there. You can utilize that during the quiz. That's perfectly fine. Um, and if you wait till the recorded session, you can play that back as well. But you've got three attempts to do it, and I think pretty much everybody should be able to get through it in three attempts. If not, then you're just going to need to register for the recorded version and then retake the quiz again. You don't have to watch it if you don't want to, but if you did fail the quiz three times, you probably should watch it on the recorded version and then take three more attempts at that quiz. You'll have a minimum of two weeks to get the quiz done for tonight's webinar, and any time you register for a future webinar, it's two weeks at least after that session as well. And we may extend the time if needed, but we want to try and get everybody done in two weeks if possible. Okay, does anybody else have any questions or have I missed any of the questions? Because some of them are going by pretty quick here. Uh, Brian did ask about handling combative head injured patients. It's going to be very difficult. Um, we did just put out some literature on you know, traumatic brain injury and patients. But if you've got a patient who is violent, um, they may need sedation from an ALS service, or to be honest with you, putting them on a long board and strapping them down can be more detrimental than them actually being a little bit combative. You may have to restrain your extremities and try to limit their motion as best as possible. But again, there's no one size fits all of this. It's going to be different for every situation. Thank you for the compliment, Evelyn. Um, I really do hope that this webinar was good for you guys. I hope that it's a, a new way to get the information out there in a more uniform way and reducing some of the impact on the local instructors and the agencies 
um, to have to set up individual sessions and get everybody trained. Um, so hopefully this does help you guys a lot. Again, we had some bumps in the road with the first one. Seems like this one went off pretty well. Some people had some issues with audio, but for the most part, everybody did pretty well, I think, with the audio on this one, and, and it went very well. Hopefully the groups that are watching out, like Good Sam and other places, um, they were able to get through this okay without any technical issues. Um, but again, we hope as we move forward here with what limitations we do have at the state, um, I'm really trying to find new ways to get this information out to you guys. Um, and with 60,000 providers in the state, that can be a little tough at times. But does anybody else have any other questions? We still have about 130 people left. Yeah, I agree, Evelyn. I was actually thinking about um, adding some more scenario type uh, pictures and things, but I also didn't want to make this too long um, of a presentation. I wanted to try and keep it as close to an hour and a half as possible and um, not make it go on and on forever. And, and really, a lot of it is going to depend on each situation and a lot of practice on your part um, as a provider and see what different ways you can keep spinal motion restriction in place for different patients. Practice all the time on your skill stations. Again, the skill sessions should be laid back scenarios where an instructor is helping you, and it's really putting all of your minds together to come up with the best plan to get that patient from point A to point B with maintaining spinal motion restriction. It's not a, an instructor holding a whip in a, a chair over you to make sure you do A, B, C, D, and E. Um, it can be done in a lot of different ways. Um, you do have to be creative. Every patient's different. This isn't a one size fits all. Um, some people, I guess, had some audio problems. I'll repeat the information about the protocol and the practical skills and the written. Uh, everybody has to be up on this by October 30th. If your agency um, has everybody on board with this before October 30th, they can start utilizing the protocol. The practical skills exam is not going to change at this point. We may make some changes down the road, but for the most part, um, you're still going to have to know how to put a patient in a short board and a long board device for carrying purposes and moving from point A to point B. You're just not going to be transporting them on those devices. The written exam has very few changes in it, and that will be ready after the September exam, or for the September exam, excuse me. But even if um, by some strange thing, if we have a disaster or something, we don't get to it. The questions that are there now are pretty pretty simple, and aren't, nobody's going to have an issue whether they've had the update or they haven't had the update. The skills portion is required. Um, the skills session should be done locally by your CIC or CLI or training officer, uh, medical director if possible, and that is required. You should get that done before October 30th. You can watch the webinar, take the quiz, and then have the skill session locally whenever it fits your guys' needs locally. Um, Don, if you're finding that nobody else can register for the sessions because they're full, we're going to send out a link for a recorded version. It might be this evening's version that we're going to send out, and people can just register to watch the recorded version at any time, any place, and then take the quiz that's going to be attached to the recorded version. There's no test for the skills portion. The skill sheets, again, are just a completion sheet to make sure that you guys have run through it locally and that you've really put your heads together to work on different patient scenarios. Again, we didn't want to make it a, a big, heavy testing environment for the skills portion. It's really a, because there is no one way to do it, so we really wanted to make it as laid back and educational as possible for you guys at the local level. Now, what happens if you have an instructor that's a little overzealous? <laughs> well, uh, not too much we can do about that, but hopefully it'll, it'll go well at the local level. Does anybody else have any questions here? You don't have to do the quiz before the skill session. You can do it tonight or anytime in the next two weeks. All right, I don't see any other questions coming up right now. Um, I did have one question about the 
recorded version. We're going to email that out, and my hope is to get it up onto our Bureau of EMS website. That usually takes an act of a god and a while to do. So that's why I wanted to get it emailed out to you guys as soon as we get it done. But that is the plan to put it up on our website so you can have access to it there and everybody can find it there. But we're going to email the link out to the world and every listserv that we own before we probably will get approval to get it up on the website. All right. I'm showing that we are 845 here. And I don't see any other questions coming through. Again, I hope that this was informative for you and it was a good way to get the information out to you. We do look forward to your constructive feedback. If you have any um, suggestions for us or good or bad points about it, please feel free to email me. Um, and we do really care about how you guys feel about doing this type of, of training. And hopefully this is a, a new way we can do things for you guys to make it more flexible and easier for everybody out in the field. So if no other questions, um, since we're getting kind of late, and I still have work to do here and then head home tonight, um, I will bid you all a farewell. Please enjoy the rest of the evening, and stay safe out there, and enjoy your patience. Take care, everybody. Thank you, and be safe.